We chant the phrases for the Brahma Viharas every night before we meditate because they're attitudes that really are conducive to getting the mind to settle down with a sense of well-being. You have no ill will for anyone, no desire to see anybody suffer. You don't resent anyone's happiness. And as for the things that you can't help or you can't change, you learn to put them aside for the time being. All of this helps to make an easy break with the issues of the day, so you can focus on the work at hand, which is your awareness right here and keeping your focused awareness on the breath. If you can't be generous with the Brahma Viharas, it's really hard to settle down. There's a passage where the Buddha actually says, people who are stingy cannot enter strong concentration. They mistrust it. A sense of ease comes up, and they don't feel right about it. There's another passage where he says that the inability to enjoy happiness is a sign of something wrong. This may sound strange. After all, the Buddha has a lot to say about the drawbacks of sensuality. But when pleasure comes, when happiness comes, they use the words, same word in Pali, sukha, for pleasure, ease, well-being, bliss. When any of these things come, you have to learn how to enjoy it. And if then, after enjoying it, you begin to realize that it has its limitations. That's when you can move on in a mature way. If you're afraid of happiness, your letting go of happiness will be neurotic and unbalanced. And you find yourself coming back at the happiness in secret, or at least trying to hide it from yourself, because the mind does crave happiness. This is where one of the least emphasized to the Brahma Viharas is important, mudita, empathetic joy, appreciation. Basically it's an attitude that when you're happy, you appreciate it. When you see other people are happy, other beings are happy, you appreciate it. You don't resent it, you're not jealous of someone else's happiness. Because if you're jealous of their happiness, then you find it's very difficult to enjoy your own. That's the karmic consequence right there. You don't have to wait for the next lifetime. If you have a very narrow idea of resenting other people's greater wealth than yours, greater intelligence, greater whatever the good fortune may be, if you resent that when they have it, then you're not going to be able to enjoy it when you gain it. And it's an attitude to extend not only to the results of good actions, which is what the happiness is, but also to the good actions themselves. You see someone else doing something meritorious. Maybe you're not able to do it yet. Someone's further along in their meditation, they're able to be more generous. Whatever. You learn not to resent that. You appreciate it. That appreciation there becomes part of your own virtue. There's a traditional belief that that's what hungry ghosts live on, is the appreciation of other people's goodness. They never develop their own goodness enough, and so they need to learn this lesson, that you don't resent other people's goodness. You hear stories in Thailand of people having visions in meditation. The most interesting ones are the ones where lots of people, without any knowledge of one another, find that they have a vision of the same spirit someplace. There was once a monk who was stabbed to death at Wamakut. He'd been dealing in Buddha images on the black market. 
and a John Fuang lived right nearby, and this monk didn't like the idea that John Fuang would be nearby. After all, John Fuang was a meditating monk. He might be awake at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., whenever the people would come in with their Buddha heads or Buddha hands with you know, no questions asked as to where they came from. So the monk did everything he could to get rid of a John Fuang. This went on for about two or three years, and then finally John Fuang was invited to start what Damasa did in Ryong, so he left. And soon after he left, the monk was stabbed to death. And then years later, John Fuang went back to the same building to teach meditation again. And people who had, knew nothing about the story and who knew nothing about one another's experiences would tell John Fuang occasionally, you know, there's this spirit of a bloody monk wandering around the building. And a John Fuang would say, okay, dedicate the merit of your meditation to him. And they'd sit there for a minute or two, and then they'd say, you know, he, does, he wouldn't accept it. He still carried that resentment of a John Fuang, even after he died. That's the case of someone who cannot appreciate other people's goodness and is going to have to suffer as a result. You don't have to look to other realms, just look at the human realm. People who can't bear to see other people's happiness. What kind of mind is that? What kind of mind state? You see it in other people and you see that it's very petty. And yet, all too often, we may have that attitude and we don't recognize it. So it's good very consciously to develop an attitude of appreciation and empathetic joy when other people are doing good things and when they're reaping the results of their good actions. It makes the mind more expansive. It is a form of generosity that you're willing to see other people do something that might be better than what you're able to do. And that generosity of spirit is a good aid to the meditation. So when you stay with the breath and it feels comfortable, you don't feel guilty about the fact that it's comfortable. You don't feel ill at ease around the comfort. Some people feel they don't deserve happiness. Well, the issue of deserving and not deserving never comes up in the Buddha's teachings. A good action, an action motivated by a skillful intention, leads to good results. It's impersonal. Unskillful actions motivated by unskillful motivations lead to pain. And so each of us has a lot of actions in the past. The Buddha never talks about having to wear off your old karma before you can gain awakening. That idea that meditation is a purification that burns away your old karma, that's actually one that he, that he ridiculed. You wonder what he would have said about a passage I read the other day in a Buddhist magazine that if you can have equanimity during sex, that can also be a form of purification. The Buddha had no, had no use for these ideas. You don't have to burn off your old karma. If you had to burn off our old karma, he said, we'd never be done. And if you can develop a good, expansive state of mind and Empathetic joy is one way of developing that expansive state of mind that helps to mitigate a lot of the results of your own past bad actions. In other words, there's the potential for suffering coming from your past actions, but there's also the potential for happiness. We all have a mixed bag, or in the Buddha's image, we all have a field of seeds of different qualities. There are seeds that grow bitter fruit, and there are seeds that grow sweet fruit. And so just because we have those in our field doesn't mean we deserve to eat nothing but bitter fruit. It's just it's there, and if we keep watering that particular seed, the fruit's going to come. But we have the choice of which seeds we're going to water.
So you want the water of your mind to be an expansive attitude. And empathetic joy is one of the best ways of expanding that attitude. As, as with goodwill, it's not simply a matter of imagining a pink cloud radiating out from your mind. You spread thoughts of empathetic joy first to people that it's easy to feel it for, the people you like, the people whose happiness you're easily happy about. And then you pose the question in mind, is there anyone else out there whose happiness I don't, don't like? whose happiness I resent. And you may find some people, well, ask yourself, what do you get out of resenting their happiness? What good comes from that? It's a narrowing of your mind to allow that resentment to stay there. And so person by person, you try to work through this. In the beginning it may be hard, but as you get more used to it, you begin to develop the attitude that you don't gain anything from anyone else's suffering. And you're not lessened by other people's happiness or their wealth or their status or the praise that's given to them, any of the worldly things that we see. You're not lessened by the fact that other people have higher dharma attainments than yours, who become noble ones. In fact, if you can appreciate the fact that they're there. That makes it a lot easier for you to practice. So search through your mind if you see any areas of resentment. Use this contemplation to help root them out. One more way of expanding the mind, making it a much nicer mind to be in, one that's not narrow one that's not fearful or resentful. That way, as you settle down with the breath and there's a sense of well-being, you can enjoy it without any sense of guilt or any sense of that may be inappropriate. When you can settle down with a sense of well-being like that, then it becomes a much more solid basis for the insight that's going to grow as your concentration gets stronger. And you're more skilled at it. So if you've been neglecting empathetic joy in your practice, maybe it's a good time to give it a little more emphasis. And there will be a brighter world as a result.